Hey everyone, we're taking a look at chapter 6 in our text. Specifically, we're thinking about in the context of learning environments uh, and how we structure and scaffold them throughout the year. We're going to take a look at the role of rules, procedures, consequences. Mainly when we think about classroom management, we think about having rules and structure in the classroom. And it's kind of interesting that we're really not getting to this discussion until halfway through, more than halfway through our time together. So that should show the place of rules and structure and consequences in our overall discussions. I think it's first important for us to think about uh, contextualizing this, thinking about the perspectives, the theoretical uh, underpinnings for the decisions that we make, and then get to the actual rules. In this chapter, we're going to think about planning of the spaces and places in our classroom. We're going to think about procedures and rules involved. We're going to think about consequences. And all of this should help us think about our classroom management plan and the development of the rules that will guide our classroom and uh, support our learners. So one of the things that we think about is in a learning environment, the first time that you come across the classroom teacher, the instructor, there generally is this expectation that we like to go through the rules on day one. We like to set the tone. Um, sometimes you hear those analogies that you're not to smile until the holidays. Um, there's even this expectation that in our higher ed classes that you go and on day one, the students basically sit there and they are read the rules of the road, the procedures for the classroom, the syllabus, and basically an overview of the expectations of the classroom. We should have questions about what that does for the community or the culture of the classroom that we're trying to build up. If we think about the beginning of the school year, there are a couple components that we need to really understand and, and set the tone with our classroom. Um, we need to think about first the classroom environment. As a very simple question, uh, what do students see the first day they go into the classroom? Um, there are generally two schools of thought. Uh, one school of thought is that the classroom should look alive and vibrant and everything is in its proper place and everything is perfectly situated to welcome the students in and make them uh, excited for and give them a hint as to what they're going to learn that year. There is another school of thought that basically suggests that the uh, classroom and the walls in the classroom, the teaching spaces should be a work in progress. Uh, that means that some of the walls might be blank. Um, and there is this indication that the students and the teacher are going to build that environment together over the upcoming year. Um, neither one of those is right or wrong. It just depends on what you see when you think about your future classroom. You also want to put some thought into the rules and procedures that you're going to have in place for your students. You want to think about the consequences that will be in your classroom. Um, what will uh, happen when students uh, push back or break the rules and they ignore the procedures or they don't attend to the procedures in your classroom. Um, and you also want to think about your rules, your procedures, your consequences. Um, so just the same way that we think about behavioral cues and actions and reactions for the students, we want to think about what you're going to do in this situation. Um, what are you going to do when students lash out against you? What are you going to do when a student is disruptive? Um, and then also, what should students expect from you? Um, will you share this, these, these rules and procedures and consequences that you have for yourself on day one? As we begin the classroom, we want to think about what the space looks like. Um, and so once again, the, the classroom on the left is all decked out, ready to go. Students uh, are welcomed in and there's some general sense as to what the class is going to be about um, and we can see um, the environment is decorated ready to go. Um, then on the right we see a far more clinical utilitarian um, almost prison-like environment um, and we have to think about which one of those settings is more conducive to the type of class we want to teach, which one is more conducive to the type of environment that we want to set with our students. All of these component parts are meaningful. 
the classroom walls, the classroom environment is just as much a part of the message and just as much a part of the teaching and learning in the classroom as the words that come out of your mouth, as the materials you put in front of them, as the, the clothes that you wear in every day, and as the uh, persona that you present to your students. If we think about seating, there are multiple ways to think about instructional groupings. Uh, instructional groupings can uh, change over time. In my class, I frequently would change uh, seating charts and seating alignments and seating order uh, depending on what we're learning that year, I mean, depending on we're learning those couple weeks or in that module. Um, you could have groups, uh, the desk set up for group work, so they could be in pairs or, or, or threes, or you could have small clusters or pods of four or six. Um, you could have that more didactic style where you have rows um, and students are in nice, neat, orderly grids in the classroom all facing forward looking at you. Um, so one of the first things to think about is with your seats and your, your activities, um, the, the seats based upon the activity, are the students facing each other or are they facing the front? Are they facing you or are they facing each other? Are they facing the wall or are they facing each other? All different components that you want to think about as you arrange seating in your classroom. One thing that you might consider is different centers in your room. Are there different areas or hubs or spots in your classroom that are more conducive to certain things than others? You might have a literacy center, a reading nook um, that is off from the area and it's sort of blocked off from other areas of the classroom. You might have a research center where most of your, uh, you know, encyclopedias and dictionaries and stuff like that are all located. You might have an area, uh, let's say your students do journal writing and they have three ring binders or they have spiral notebooks. Um, you might have those stored in the classroom and you want those in a space where students can go and get them and get in and out with their notebooks and they're not um, sort of stuck in a, in a, in a area where there's no real uh, traffic patterns. Um, they might have science centers or art stations or technology stations. So you're going to want to, to think about those, um, you know, areas or sections or centers of the classroom and try and figure out where them might be placed, uh, placed, placed. And then what do we do with the desks and the grouping or organization of the desks around that? Um, so it's a lot of different moving parts to think about what this might look like. Last but not least, you're going to want to think about um, human beings, little human beings that are moving in and out and trying to establish traffic patterns in and around your classroom. You're going to want to think about school safety. You're going to want to think about um, their movement in the classroom, um, about their, their distance to other individuals, uh, and about social distancing, uh, meaning staying away from one another and having, uh, you know, a little area for them to be themselves, not the social distancing that we've come to know and love. So you're going to want to think about high usage areas. You're going to want to think about sections that might have those journals or a sink area, especially doors, um, you know, exit doors to the classroom are very important. You're going to make sure that those are free and clear. You're also going to want to think about um, exit doors, but also windows. Um, is it easy to get to them in case of an emergency? Um, if there is something like a critical incident where you have the shelter in place, can you, uh, is there a place in your room where you can sort of like shut and lock the door and hide away from windows and doors um, so that large numbers of students can shelter in place if needed? So you're going to want to think about um, the, the pedagogical opportunities to instructional groupings, but also think about safety and think about, you know, what happens if there is a critical incident? What happens if, the, if there is a fire? What happens when the bell rings and all of the students want to leave at once? You're going to want to think about traffic um, and, and those patterns in your classroom. You also want to think about um, the, the walls as a teaching space in the classroom. You're going to want to think about what the walls say about you, say about the content, say about them. Um, and walls generally, what we're looking at is three A's. We're thinking about general announcements. Um, this is pretty easy to understand. You're going to want to think about possible achievements. So a lot of times we use this as a way to look at student work or give students a shout out. Um, but then you're also going to want to think about account accountability. You're going to want to think about some of the rules and some of the regulations for the classroom 
You want to think about some of the goals and objectives. So many times if we think about a project-based learning environment, we will highlight uh, driving questions or essential questions. You might think about a school that might have a school motto or, um, you know, a, a, a sort of uh, belief statement for the school um, that might be an area where you put that up so that all students know what the sort of mantra or the ethos of that school or of your classroom might be also it's important to think about the use of color in the space um, color can invigorate color says many things for uh, different purposes you're going to want to think about the use of color in your classroom and what it says to your learners um, obviously there's other ways to express emotion in your classroom um, but you're going to want to think about the use of color in your classroom and what it does to the emotional state for your students are you going for balance and neutral and calm? Are you going for something that uh, inspires your creativity? In this same vein, I would not loop it in with color, but I would think about other components of the classroom. Do you have plants in your classroom? Do you have vegetation? Do you have animals in your classroom? Do you have a fish tank? Do you have some sort of other uh, you know, life form in your classroom that is trying to inspire students and it's a product of the environment? Um, so you're going to want to think about these different components and what impact that has on the environment and then ultimately the culture and the climate of your classroom. In the classroom management plan, you're going to want to think about the organizational space in your classroom. And so one of the easiest things to do is sort of sketch out um, what this might look like. And you're going to want to think about desks and chairs. You're going to want to think about human beings. You're going to want to think about um, uh, modes of egress. Uh, you're going to think about doors and windows. You're going to think about your desk. Where is that placed? Um, different boards, presentation materials, um, what the space looks like. There are multiple ways to develop this space. There are multiple ways to express the space. It might be something as simple as sketching it out on a piece of paper, but obviously we can use a lot of the digital tools. Um, I've seen people in the past use uh, digital tools, uh, graphic design tools like Canva. I've seen people build their perfect classroom in Minecraft and use that as a way to express that to others. Obviously, your future classroom and the shape and structure of the classroom is going to uh, determine, maybe dictate the way that your classroom is set up and the organizational structure. Obviously, the culture of the building is going to help determine and maybe dictate the way you lay out your classroom. But for the most part, most of our classrooms are the typical rectangular um, or square shape. So it's pretty safe to go with that uh, organization unless you think of something completely different that you're looking for. As you think about your classroom, you're going to want to generally conduct an audit to see is your classroom ready for students to enter. Um, so is the arrangement appropriate? Um, do I have uh, an opportunity for students to get in and out of the classroom. Is that safe? Can students get in and out of the classroom and get to their desks? Is that safe? Um, do I have students that might have a physical uh, disability? Uh, do I have students in a wheelchair that need the opportunity to get back to a desk and that's sort of blocked off? Um, is uh, are, is there uh, an easy line of sight to any materials that students need to be able to see or are they face the wrong way or there's things hanging from the ceiling? Um, is it generally appropriately arranged? Do I have enough tables and chairs? Um, do I have the exits marked? Do students know what to do with the exits? Uh, do I uh, have the emergency procedures posted? Do students know what to do with that? Um, it's always shocking to me when I go into a school, into a classroom in K-12 or higher ed, and we don't really pay any mind to the emergency procedures. We don't really uh, make it clear where the exits are, and then what do we do in case of an emergency? Where do we go? Most schools, if not all schools, have uh, protocols for different types of emergencies. It's important to know what those protocols are. Depending on the 
uh, policies of the building, you're going to want to have those posted up in the classroom so that students know when it's a code yellow or code white, what do we do in those instances? Um, is the room clean and orderly? Is it a mess? Um, is it generally just a pigsty all the time? Do we have um, cleaning supplies, food, medicine, stuff like that? If so, um, if they're allowed, are they stored properly? Um, it's always a blast when you're teaching and then you notice that one of your students left their lunchbox behind or a backpack behind and you see uh, insects and ants coming in through the classroom. That's always a, a wonderful time. Um, is there a schedule posted? Is there generally a reminder of what the schedule is for the day so that students know what to expect and students know where they are headed? Um, and then also, are, is there a first aid kit available? Um, are there opportunities to help students if and when some sort of emergency occurs? So as we begin, we want to think about processes in our classrooms. We want to think about productivity. We want to, we want to think about workflow. We want to think about not just the, the work product, but work process. Generally, when you develop rules and procedures, you want to think about what are your expectations for the classroom. You want to think about what sort of assignments you believe that you will generally give. You want to think about what does it look like for students to learn and interact in your classroom. Is there a lot of collaboration? Are students talking to one another? Um, perhaps you want students just to sit in rows and face you and you will lecture all of the time. So what is the most important for you? What does learning look like and sound like in your classroom? And as you think about that, you're going to want to try and understand the process involved. And then you're going to try and outline what are the procedures and rules, the habits and boundaries that get you to that point. Um, so as students work, as they learn, what are the rules, what are the processes, what are the habits, what are the boundaries? The second part of the question is, after we've discussed the processes that will lead us to success, then the second part of the question really is, what happens when people don't follow those rules? What happens when um, the rules are not explicit and explained to students? Um, or they choose to ignore the rules and procedures, or they don't fully, fully, you know, fully understand it. What happens when certain individuals sort of push back against those policies and procedures and rules and habits? Um, and then what does that mean for just the, the student that pushes back, but then also other students in the classroom? So in terms of procedures, we, be, we generally uh, view this as a, a way of being. This is how we do things in class. This is our culture in the classroom. This is usually activity specific. In this, we want to provide clear expectations for behaviors. We want to let students know how they're supposed to do specific things and what are your expectations and be as specific, as granular as possible. So it might be something as simple as your expectations for entering the classroom, okay? So it might be when you enter the classroom, you're not to stop and ask me what we're doing that day. You're not to uh, start talking with other friends about what happened uh, the class before or what happened on the bus that morning. Um, this is not an opportunity to uh, have the student dictate what's happening for the day. It might be something as simple as come into the room quietly, Get your journal from the milk crate, sharpen your pencil, sit down, look at the prompt up on the board and begin to write. Um, and there is generally an expectation of how we do business in this classroom. Um, and as long as you're clear about what the expectations are, um, then you create the environment where you expect the students to raise up their behavior to meet your expectations. The reason you want procedures is that this minimizes the need for constant redirection. It builds self-regulation in our students. There is a need for practice. There is no uh, misconception that should be brought up here saying that just because I put the five steps for entering the classroom up on the board that students will automatically do it. No, what will happen is your first two, three weeks of school, you basically outline what are the procedures for entering the classroom? 
What are the procedures for peer review? So you might start with two or three procedures. Maybe the first week is entering the class and leaving the class, entering the class and leaving the class. Then every day you highlight the procedures, you talk about what your expectations involve, and then you practice what this looks like. Um, this over time, if it's practice, then students generally understand what the procedures are, what your expectations are, and then how to follow through. Specific procedures, you might think about the start of the day and the end of the day, the start of the period, the end of the period. What do we generally do as we begin and end the learning activity? This is a fantastic way to start thinking about procedures. Um, so at the start of the day, we might say, come on in, sit down, you're quiet, you start work on the morning prompt or the morning announcements or whatever it is. Um, there also might be an opportunity to have check-ins or recite the class motto or some sort of community building activity. So you sort of bring the learners back into the environment, remind them of what they're all there for. At the end of the day, at the end of the class, we're generally looking at closure. Um, we want to first of all focus on safety especially if we're sending students back out into the hallway or back out to buses or out to the uh, outside world you want to think about safety and making sure that you know where students are and where they're going and everyone is safe you also want to make sure that students help clean and take care of the environment um, many times i see the students just leave and take off and then the student the, the teacher spends a lot of time cleaning up the classroom um, there should be an expectation that students will clean up after themselves they'll push their chairs back in they'll realign the desks um, any scrap papers put away or recycled um, their materials that they use are put away or put back in their backpacks and stuff like that but you generally want the classroom returned to the state where they found it um, this generally is a good habit of mind there's also different ways in terms of procedures to ask for help or get the attention of the teacher. Um, you may want students calling out for your attention. You may not. Um, you may want them to use hand signals, um, show you how many fingers when they want to speak or they have to use the restroom or something like that. What are the policies and procedures of the building? But then what are the policies and procedures for your classroom? Um, you also want to think about how students generally keep you informed about how they are regulating their behaviors and their activity. So to gain attention, sometimes we have a chant like a call and response or a chorus. Um, in other grades, we see, um, you know, a, a poem or some sort of responsive activity where once you start, the students follow in a choral activity. Um, there's other uh, tools that people use in some computer labs that I've worked in in some middle school high school classrooms we use um, solo cups or little colored markers so students as they were working they could um, you know show a, a green cup if everything was fine a yellow cup if they were struggling um, but could still work and then a red cup if they really needed help right then and there you also want to think about other procedures that are going to occur um, and what your expectations are and what will happen. You don't want to make it up as you go along. Um, so there is a likelihood that students will be tardy. They will be late to your class. Um, there will be a situation where um, you change groups. You want students to have new assigned seats that day or the the, the room might go from you know rows and and uh, the chairs are all in rows and then you might have them in groups. That doesn't mean that the world goes upside down and students freak out. That is just a normal part of business and you are changing the arrangement of your room. That is your job. Um, you should also have specific procedures for how you maintain your desk area and then also students maintain their desk area. Um, you will often see that students, especially in late elementary on up, um, usually like to come in and place things on the teacher desk. You may or may not want that. Um, you also want students to be cognizant of their workspace and what you expect their desk to look like. One of the things to think about here is, especially for the students, you want to think about work process. Um, you want to think about helping students think about the ways in which they learn and the ways in which they work. 
and support them so that they can maximize uh, the ways in which they get things done um, and make their life a little bit easier. You want to work with students on what to do if you finish early. We always have those students that immediately finish their work and then they sort of sit there and try to figure out what to do. Many times we see students like that get bored and they become disciplinary problems because they are bored and they're just tired of sitting there waiting for others um, so they will act out. So you get to figure out, okay, what happens if you finish early? I would generally suggest that you have a pretty regular policy of if and when you finish early, go get your silent sustained reading book and read from it or read your accelerated reader or hear some art pieces you can color in or you can journal or maybe you have a multitude of activities. But generally, it's a good idea to have a kit of silent work for students to do if they finish it when they finish early. You want to have procedures for what happens when a student is sick is suddenly ill, if a student has to go to the bathroom, um, and most importantly, if you are responding to an emergency, it should not be, we should not wait for a critical incident for us to finally decide what the processes are. There should be a general expectation that if there is a fire drill, if there is a, an active shooter warning or a bomb threat or whatever the case may be, the students know what the expectations are, okay? We want to think about a safe environment and how we can ensure that our students are safe. So the procedure might be that when the, in my classroom, when a fire bell went off or whatever, there's a fire drill, that didn't mean that the students immediately got up and ran. Um, when the fire bell went off, my procedure was that students would stay seated. If they were not seated, they would sit down and they would all be silent. They would wait for me to grab my student roll book so I could take attendance. Once we were all seated and quiet, then we would stand up, we'd push in our chairs, and we'd slowly, quietly walk to the door. Once we were all at the door in a line, we would walk out of the door, through the hallways, through the exit door for the building, and go outside in one single file quiet line. This was not us running all over like crazy people. This wasn't uh, people talking all over the place. We were a silent, orderly procedure out of the building. When we left the building, then we would we knew exactly where we were going at all times. So if you got lost or distracted or whatever happened, you knew where we would be all of the time. You would go back to that point and regroup, and I would take attendance. And then after I took attendance then students would sit down or wait for further announcements. That was something that we practiced. That was something that was understood, and it wasn't a surprise when a uh, safety event would occur. There's different ways that we can uh, get students' attention. Um, these nonverbal or verbal uh, cues, these choral events, uh, help let students know exactly what it is. This is also a safety issue, um, so this could be a uh, student shouts out hocus pocus, then students say everybody focus, macaroni and cheese, everybody freeze. The, the basic idea here is you want to think about your environment, you want to think about your students, and what are ways that in a choral call and answer response, you can get the attention of your students um, and immediately get their attention. The key here, the focus is immediate attention. There is no hey all, listen to me, boys and girls, boys and girls, and waiting and waiting and pleading for their attention if there is a safety risk. You immediately, at any point, need to be able to get the attention of your students and bring them back and have them pay attention to you. Um, that is a safety concern that we really can't uh, stray from. We also want to think about transitions. Um, a lot of times uh, classroom management issues pop up, disruptions pop up, when there are transitions. So if a student is actively reading and then they finish the reading and they move over to write about what they just read, or if they're writing and they move to a peer review process, if they're in a science lab and they're, they're working on the science experiment and then they go to put materials back and go work on writing the lab report, usually transitions create these windows for some sort of disruption in the activity. So one of the things that you want to do is um, think about 
opening and closing tasks. So generally give students a time warning. Um, in two minutes, I'm going to say or do this. In my classes, I will have silent sustained writing, or I'll have a drop everything and write, or a quick write, and I'll give students seven minutes, eight minutes, ten minutes to write and answer uh, an open response question. And generally what I'll say is, okay, we have about three minutes to go. We have about two minutes to go. We are not done with this activity yet, but we will be in two minutes. So I want you to start to think about what is the the way out of the writing piece that you're in now. Um, so give students a, a time warning saying, okay, we're not really done yet, but we're about to. So try and come to closure on what you're working on. Also help students prepare to transition over. You want them to know when this event ends, what are you to do? Um, it's generally a good idea, and we learn this the first couple of times as a teacher. You want students to know what they are doing before they actually do it. Um, usually we say, okay, we're done, we're moving on, and then you explain what you want your students to do in, that, uh, in, those, in those moments. Um, generally, it's a good idea to help them prepare when they move to the new task, when there are transitions, you want to refocus them. You want to say, okay, now here's how we're doing work here. Uh, get your materials out, turn to this page. We're going to start with this section and we're going to do a read aloud. Um, so you want to bring students right back in and know, let them know what happens after the transition. Um, generally, I believe that you should not be talking and calling out during transitions. Um, I have colleagues, I have friends that uh, as students are transitioning, as they're putting materials away and moving to another activity, I have colleagues that will suddenly remember what they wanted to tell students. And then they're yelling on top of the students saying, boys and girls, boys and girls, you should do this or make sure you do that or this is for homework. This is stuff that you should be clear and explicit and explain it to students before they move explain it a couple times, make sure it's understood, ask if there's any questions. If there's no questions, you should be able to say, now go. And then the students move and do what you ask them to do. When they come out of the transition and they go to the next activity, then you can start talking again. If you're yelling over top, that means that you didn't prepare them adequately for what they were about to do. In your classroom, you also want to be considerate of rules, habits, boundaries? What are non-negotiables in your classroom? Uh, generally, I view this as uh, the way that we do business, how we act, um, and this begins and ends, in my opinion, with uh, clearly stated expectations, what you expect. Um, this might be these expectations, these rules and habits and boundaries might be something that you uh, script out with your students or you might develop it on your own. It depends on your theoretical perspectives. But generally, you're looking at preventing or encouraging behavior. You want to let your students know what the expectations are, what are the expected habits, what are the expected boundaries, um, how do we act, how do we do business in the classroom. And these are things that we definitely want to prevent our students from doing or we want them to act a certain way. Um, we also need to have our rules be fair, uh, applied sensibly and consistently across all classes, all students. Obviously, context is important. Uh, different types of learners are going to be able to follow the rules better or worse than other learners. I think it's important to explain to students why we have the rules, why, uh, what is the rationale for those rules. One of the things that I said frequently to my students is, I will always explain to you why we have a specific rule or some sort of uh, consequence in the classroom. I will explain to you why I expect certain behaviors. I may not explain it right then and there, but at some point I will explain it to you. Um, there might be something that's happening. It might be a safety issue, um, but there is always a rationale behind what I'm asking you to do. Um, and I also think that it's important to hold the teacher and the student accountable. Um, it's important for all members of the community to understand that the rules uh, fit for all. Um, and it's not just one group or the other. A lot of times I would see this where 
when I was teaching eighth grade, my students could look out the window and down at the end of the, the street, they would see some of the teachers would uh, go off on a smoke break. And my students would sit there and they'd be, hey, mister, I thought that you said smoking was bad, but those teachers are over there smoking. I didn't really have an answer for them. So I think it's important to have discussions with students about accountability. It's important to talk about the accountability of adults, um, especially if we're dealing with adolescents. There's an opportunity to talk about expectations and rules and habits and boundaries and perhaps use it as a vehicle to talk about some of the challenges that people have as they uh, mature. Generally, when we talk about rules, it's a bit problematic to have pages and pages and pages and pages or posters full of rules. Um, generally, we want to think about effective numbers of rules. In an earlier video, I discussed that um, in my classrooms, I generally just had one rule and that focused on respect, respect for self, respect for others. Um, we want to think about what is an appropriate number of rules that everyone can remember. Um, so if we're thinking about early child elementary, perhaps we're generally looking at four rules, four rules to, in total. Uh, middle grades and beyond, maybe we're looking at about six rules that are non-negotiables. Um, also, we've talked about developing those rules, co-constructing the rules and the expectations along with your students. Um, we should word our rules in a positive framing. Um, so instead of something along the lines of don't talk out of turn or be quiet, maybe it's raise your hand and wait to be called on before speaking. Um, we don't want to have a negative tone as we write these rules. Um, and then it's okay to bring new rules in and phase rules out, uh, depending on the structure of the classroom, depending on the focus of the classroom, depending on how things are operating with students. Maybe you realize that my students don't really need a rule for talking out in class anymore. Maybe that's not really a problem, but um, I have uh, a challenge with students asking questions before they, you know, ask three and then ask me. Um, in terms of consequences, we want to think about what's going to happen if and when a student breaks the rule. Um, we, we view consequences as the what happens when students abide by or disregard a rule or procedure. So all rules and procedures should have consequences. So a consequence is either when the student does exactly what you wanted or when they push back against uh, or disregard that rule. But every single rule and procedure should have a consequence. So as you develop the rules and procedures for your classroom should also talk about what the consequences might be. And maybe you help have students help you develop those or identify those consequences. Certain natural consequences that are normally accepted in our classes, um, they, they might happen when there is uh, a behavior and there's no real teacher intervention. So what happens when a student runs in class? What happens when the student pulls another student's hair. There's certain things that generally there are accepted rules in the building. There are rules and expectations and disciplinary um, consequences that occur that you don't really need that rule specifically in your classroom. There's also logical consequences. Um, you might talk about what happens when uh, there is behavior and the teacher intervenes. So let's say the teacher removes five minutes from recess because a student runs a class or, or the teacher um, calls because of the hair pulling. So the logical is when the teacher sort of intervenes and gets involved. And then we have contrived consequences. Um, we basically view this as punishment for punishment's sake. Um, there's no real behavioral benefit. Um, there is basically uh, a, a behavior or a pattern of behaviors that you as the teacher do not like. And so you are trying to develop some sort of punishment or consequence that you believe is going to impact positively or negatively uh, the breaking of the rules, but the student can't really make that connection. So this is the, the teacher that says, okay, you've forgotten your homework twice in one week, so we're running laps, or I'm taking these different, you know, these other 
uh, functions of the class away because you didn't have it. Um, so generally, uh, what we do is we think about what are uh, appropriate consequences, what are natural and logical consequences that we might use. So once again, a natural consequence would be what happens when a student does something and the teacher doesn't interfere um, or intervene, sorry. A logical consequence is what happens when something happens and the teacher does intervene. So one of the things we look at is, okay, what happens in this instance where Ginny pushes Sam off the monkey bars at recess, if the teacher does not intervene, what happens if the teacher does intervene? What is an appropriate consequence for that? Um, you want to think about, okay, what happens when someone submits the work, um, you know, forgets to do their work as part of a group in our middle grades or secondary classroom? What happens when the teacher does not intervene? What happens when the teacher does intervene? Um, and we can think about different situations where a student might uh, be a disruption and what are the consequences. We will unpack a lot of this in our discussion in class. We'll unpack this as we do some um, role playing and interact with others and think about what are some of the natural and logical um, consequences that we might have for student behaviors. Um, other consequences that we might have that we see often in our classroom, uh, we have reminders and warnings. Reminders and warnings work, although if our students uh, see or hear the reminders multiple times and we don't act on it, then they really are not a reminder or warning. The student learns to just ignore uh, those signals that you're sending. You might uh, move or remove the student. So you might have an, a, a timeout where you remove the student from the classroom or remove them from their group. Um, you might remove them from uh, that area of the playground, but basically physically distancing the student from the area, from the situation. You might have the student offer an apology. You might remove or revoke privileges. You might send messages home, and then you might um, bring in the administration and you might think about, uh, you know, disciplinary referrals, suspension, expulsion. One of the things that I would like to highlight here is that it's important to have a paper trail. So on this hierarchy, this level of triage here, as you start to give reminders and warnings and then move the student and, and have other uh, consequences that are brought into the situation, it's of, uh, it's important to have a space where for each child you document the consequences that you have taken. The reason for this is if and when you go to the disciplinary route in terms of using the administrator, you want to generally it helps to hand the administrator a referral, a write up, some sort of uh, situation that you want them to help you deal with. And when you give that to your administrator, you can give them that sheet where you indicate the, the uh, extent of this problem and all of the steps that you took already. And so in my experience, a lot of times administrators like that because they can see that this is something that has been a chronic problem and you've been trying to deal with it. And now you basically are out of options. If we think about behaviors and consequences, there are a multitude of ways that we can um, address this. If a student is regularly late or tardy, we might have them uh, lose points on uh, assessments that happen at the beginning of class. Um, if they are generally uh, late, uh, if they have uh, homework that's not coming back to class, they're losing grade points. Um, we see instances where students aren't prepared for school, so we will ask for collateral. I've had colleagues that ask for a student's shoe I don't like that idea, but they ask for a student's shoe uh, for a classroom pen or pencil. Um, if students are regularly calling out, we might uh, offer general reminders or redirect them at an earlier age. Um, if there's cursing and profanity in the classroom, uh, middle grade, secondary, depending on the population, we might bring them outside in the hallway and talk about, okay, what's going on here? Why are we using this language in the, in the classroom? Um, 
If it's at an earlier grade, we might try and identify different words that we might want to use. And if we're destroying property, if we're tagging up things um, or stealing things, um, we might deal with other uh, consequences. We might have apologies, restitution, stuff like that. So one of the things to think about when we think about our procedures and rules in the classroom is what are we doing and how are we trying to make sure that we are consistent? Um, what are we doing to keep in the loop between uh, the, the, the pupil to pupil, the, the bringing in the parents, we're thinking about the community. How are we making sure that our policies and procedures and rules are representative of our population? How do we make sure that we are consistent um, that we're not sliding for certain certain groups or sliding for certain, uh, you know, students. Um, it's also important to uh, keep track of what you've done throughout the year. Uh, so keep track in terms of individual students, but also keep track for uh, entire groups, uh, maybe all of your classes or specific classes. What have you done already? What has worked? What has not worked? What are some of the rules and procedures? What do you need to keep doing? Um, what do you need to sort of like go back and restart? Or what are new areas that you need to focus on? But it's important to think about the rules and procedures and habits and the ways we act in our classroom and keep revisiting those. And that might be something that you do with your students. When we think about um, bringing new policies and procedures into our classroom. We want to think about how we build up this uh, culture. We build to automaticity in our classroom. Just because we say to do something, it doesn't mean that our students are going to automatically understand it and gladly do it. I know, surprise, surprise, but we want to think about what are we going to do to have our students understand what the expectations are and do it. So we generally see uh, five R's. So we're going to review what is the rule, what are the expectations. We're going to rehearse what that rule or expectation or procedure is. So in my instance earlier, my example of the fire drill, yes, we would rehearse what does it look like when we have a fire drill. I would say we're going to rehearse a fire drill now. You will not hear a bell, but basically I'm going to ring a bell or make some sort of signal and there is a fire drill and we are going to practice what this looks like. This might also be a rehearsal of walking to lunch. This might be rehearsal of walking out to the bus. Um, so review what the procedure or policy or habit is, rehearse it, and then we are going to reinforce it. And what that means is we're going to remind students um, that when we have a fire drill, when we go to the cafeteria, when we go to the buses, when we start class, when we end class, this is what we do. Visually, verbally, socially, this is what we look like. This is the way that we act. This is how business is done in our classroom. It's important to do this over and over and over. We're going to review, rehearse, reinforce, remind, and remember again and again and again. And so the first two weeks of school, the first three weeks of school, you might be reviewing and rehearsing. You might be going through, this is the way my class starts. This is the way that my class ends. This is the way school starts. This is the way school ends. This is the way we go to our lockers. This is the way we ask how to go to the bathroom. And so generally the first couple weeks of school might be, what are the rules and strategies and habits and practices that our school uses or our classroom uses? And here's how we do business. And that's all well and good, but the challenge is generally we uh, are not there if we're a clinical teacher and we go in and halfway through the year to observe, we don't see what the beginning of the year looks like. Um, conversely, uh, sometimes new students will come and they were not there for the first two, three weeks. Maybe you had a great opening of the year and you practiced everything and you reviewed and you, uh, you practiced everything and students were doing a great job. And then a new student comes in and they don't know how things operate. They don't know the culture that you've built. Definitely understandable. Certain populations, students are very transient. So uh, first thing we want to do is explain what the rules and the structure of the classroom are. Explain how business is done in your classroom. 
Um, this might be a copy of the classroom rules and procedures. It might be something up on your website. It might be something in the classroom on the bulletin board. But basically, what are the rules? Then you talk a little bit about what it means and why they're there. Um, some schools, some classrooms will have a, uh, a student liaison or an ombudsman, basically one student that is a buddy. They are, and this might be something that rotates around, but the, the, the liaison is a student in the room that explains, okay, here's what Mr. O'Brien expects. Here's the way we do business here. Here's the way that we go to lockers. Here's the way we go to lunch. And this is why we do those things. And it's important because then you have a student that basically is translating into student language um, what the expectations are, and it helps welcome in the student to the new environment. Um, and then it's also an opportunity to remember that the student is new to the environment and you don't know what they've seen in the past. So perhaps you want to practice a couple times and uh, direct your uh, students to, uh, you know, show this new peer, this new colleague, exactly the way that things operate. And so we're going to practice the fire drill because we haven't done it in a couple weeks or a couple months. We want to practice it again so we can see what it looks like. And I'm going to bring our new student over here and they're going to stand with me and we're going to observe you as you go through the procedure. Um, and so there's an opportunity to, you know, invite in and elevate the students so they can see uh, what's happening from your vantage point. And once again, we want to check back in and reevaluate these policies and procedures. Maybe when a new student comes in, depending on the time of the year, maybe it's an opportunity to revisit and revise those policies and procedures. So once again, if we're thinking about our classroom rules, we want to keep those posted. We want to be transparent. We want to uh, have consequences established. Um, we want to understand um, what this means for our students um, and, and revise and, and, poss and possibly uh, change them over time. Uh, we want to keep it simple. We want to think about numbers of rules that we have there. And we want to think about different ways we interact with those rules. So we might have a simple set of classroom rules in the beginning of the year. We're going to do some role playing and figure out what they mean. After we've practiced it a couple times, we're going to role play. Maybe we have songs that are associated with it so that we can make a mnemonic or call and response uh, component of this. Maybe this is something that the rules are folded into a game. Um, we know how much our students love games, or maybe there are on quizzes that you have. Maybe you have questions about the rules. So it might be a vocab quiz or a science quiz, and maybe extra credit points are given for questions about the classroom rules to see if students are really paying attention to what you're talking about. So in summary, one of the things we want to think about is we want to begin the school year thinking about whether or not our classroom and we as professionals, whether or not we're all ready for the school year to begin. We want to think about the placement of uh, materials and spacing in the classroom. We want to think about uh, the, the organization and the colors and the look and the feel. We want to think about the classroom readiness checklist and are we ready to go or not? Um, and what is the thought process behind that? We also want to think about the classroom environment. We want to think about a, a theme or a mission or a mascot or a general focus for the year um, and use that as a identifying cry for the year. So some schools will have a one word uh, for the year. So the, the focus word for this year is growth or the focus word is humility or whatever the case may be. So what is the focus of that year? What is the, the main topic or theme? And then is it something that helps you organize that classroom environment? I also think it's important to share ownership and development of that culture with students. Um, that means keeping the number of rules manageable. So we're talking three, four rules for early childhood elementary, maybe five, six rules for middle grade secondary. Um, state those expectations in a positive way. Have um, consequences for uh, the, all of our rules and procedures so that students know what's going to happen if they break or follow a rule. What are the consequences of that? And last but not least, try and figure out fun ways to 
practice those rules, practice those procedures, you know, find a way to make it a game, make it a song, make it extra credit on a quiz, but different ways to really embed it in what we do. So hopefully that was meaningful for you, some guidance as you think about and work on your classroom management plan. I hope you're all doing well.